looking at uh, the second lesson in the series on the Lord's Supper. And this one is entitled, The Purposes, The Purposes of the Lord's Supper. You know, kids are notorious for asking the question, why? It doesn't matter what the instructions are or what the activity is. They have an insatiable desire to find out the reason for everything in life. Um, And sometimes we can even get frustrated with hearing that over and over again. Why are we doing this? Why, 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 why? They want an explanation for it all. Sometimes that can irritate us when we don't want to have to be answering that all the time. But the truth is, why is a good question to ask? And we should all probably be examining our lives a little closer uh, closer and posing that question to ourselves. Uh, we could ask that question on uh, the way we spend our time. Why do I spend my free time on this activity? Why am I so driven to accomplish this particular goal? Uh, why do I struggle with anger or discouragement Why am I concerned with what others think of me? Why am I fearful? Why do I have a desire for more money or comfort or for whatever? It's a good question to evaluate kind of how we're doing spiritually. And just as it is true in our personal lives, it is true in our church life as well. It's good for us to reflect on why we do things. Sometimes we'll find that when we ask why, it's simply just based on tradition. We've always done it that way. Why do we have Sunday school in the morning and Awana in the evening? Well, that's just kind of how we've always done it. We have Awana at 5, Sunday school earlier, and that's just historically what we've done, so it makes sense to keep doing it that way. Sometimes it's more practical. Why do we have a time of welcome? When the choir was singing, we normally have a welcoming of the guests and visitors in prayer time right before the choir sang. Why did we do it that way? Well, because we needed sometimes for a pianist to be able to move from one section to the other, or choir members to get in place. So it, it was a good spot for us to just practically have a little transition time. But sometimes we do things because there is teaching in the Scripture that compels us to organize or structure things in a certain way. Every time we gather together as a body, we sing, we preach, and we pray. Why do we do that? Is those just things that we decided, this sounds good for a church service? No, this is what we think the Bible teaches a body of believers should be doing during the corporate worship time. We want to preach the word. We want to sing the word. We want to pray the word. And so because Scripture teaches us that, that's why we have our services the way we do. Now, when it comes to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, it is vital that we understand the purpose and the meaning of what we're doing when we partake of the bread and the cup. Like a curious toddler, we should come in asking the question, why? Why are we doing this? What is so significant and meaningful about a group of people coming together to eat a little piece of bread and drink a little bit of juice? So that's the goal for tonight. We want to look from the Bible and see what Scripture says is the reason we partake in this ordinance called the Lord's Supper. Now, last week, Pastor gave an overview of both ordinances, baptism and communion, and talked about what they are and who should participate. And if you missed that, I would encourage you to go back and watch that or listen to that. Uh, But tonight, we're really going to dig into the purpose of communion. I see five clear reasons, five clear reasons from Scripture why we partake in this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll jump into uh, the outline. God, I pray that you would help us tonight as we learn about the Lord's Supper and what it means for us. I pray that we would understand why we're doing this. This would not just be a ritual or routine or a habit, but God, it would be something meaningful and significant in your name. Amen. Uh, The first purpose of the Lord's Supper is this. We gather together to take the bread, to drink the cup, in order to remember Christ and his sacrifice. To remember Christ and his sacrifice. Jesus actually states this explicitly in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. He said that his followers were to do this in remembrance of me. Uh, the elements themselves are pictures that stir our memories to look back and remember what Christ did for us on the cross. As we take the bread Our minds should be taken back to Calvary and see the broken body of Jesus Christ. As we take the cup and drink the juice, we should picture the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. 
Uh, Paul had to remind the Corinthian church about this in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. The, the believers in Corinth were coming together and they were not remembering what Christ had done for them. In fact, they were feasting. There were some people that were eating their fill and gluttony and drunkenness while others were going hungry without anything to eat. And they were doing this and calling it the Lord's table or communion. And instead of remembering Jesus, the, the members at Corinth were selfish and thinking only of their desires and wants. So Paul had to remind them, no, no, no. The thing that you do, the bread and the cup, you were supposed to do it in remembrance of Christ. And he actually tells them that twice in that chapter. You're supposed to do this in memory of who and what Jesus did for you. Uh, the memorial view of the supper, which is what Baptists have historically held to, has this idea at its core. Every believer that comes to the table should meditate on the crucifixion of Christ and remember the sacrifice that he made on their behalf. We should see the price of our sin. We should see the love of our Savior. We should see the holiness and the wrath and the justice and the mercy of God all converging at one point the cross of Calvary, and we should remember all that was done for us. This is why it's so important that communion be reserved for believers only, uh, because you cannot look back on something that you have never looked on at the first place. You know, I cannot memorialize my time in the military because I've never served in the military. Uh, similarly, in order uh, to remember Christ and his sacrifice, you first need to have experienced the sacrifice of Christ through salvation. Uh, so in a week and a half, when we come together to partake of the table, we are doing so in order to remember Christ and what he did. The supper is more than a ritual. It is more than a relic. It is more than a tradition. It was given so that we would remember. Number two, uh, the supper is given in order that we might proclaim the gospel. Purpose number two is to proclaim the gospel. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says this, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink the cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Uh, that word show in the Greek means to declare or announce or proclaim publicly. It is used 17 times in the New Testament. Ten of those times it is actually translated as preach. So the supper is not meant just for us privately to experience something. It is a public declaration of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord. Communion is an evangelistic tool for unbelievers who are present when the ordinance is, or when the ordinance is carried out. Now, pastor talked about it last week. Um, they are not to participate in communion. Um, we don't want unbelievers coming in and participating. Just as I said, they've never experienced salvation, so they can't look back on it. But we do want them to watch and see and hear the proclamation of the gospel as they watch a group of people come together and remember something that happened 2,000 years ago. It says that we do show the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the only reason that we can show the Lord's death until he comes is because the Lord who died did not stay dead. And so the reason we, we look back on a death and yet we look forward to a return is because the person that died back here on Calvary didn't stay in the grave. He rose up and he promised to come back for us again. And so as we come and we eat the bread and we drink the juice, we are proclaiming, yes, he died, but he did not stay dead. And because of that, we celebrate the power of the gospel. Now, there is a sense of sorrow and grief as Christians remember the suffering and the death of Jesus, but there is also hope in that he defeated death. R. Stanton Norman wrote, as is the case with baptism, this ordinance is a visual sermon that proclaims the meaning of the death of Jesus Christ. The meal is a visible proclamation of the substitutionary death of Jesus. Now at a baptism, we had a baptism recently. Uh, somebody came and they identified with Jesus uh, by going down into the water and being raised up. We even say raised to newness of life. Well, at a baptism, an unbeliever is confronted with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as pictured by somebody who says, just as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, so also I am now dead to my old ways and yet alive unto Christ. The same thing is true with the supper. The supper. 
An unbeliever can see the picture of the broken body of Christ. They can see a visual representation of the blood of Christ that was shed. And they should recognize through this ordinance that they need faith in this risen Savior. In a great little book called Understanding the Lord's Supper, Bobby Jamison wrote, The Lord's Supper is an evangelistic ordinance, not in the sense that it helps convert people, but in that it highlights their need to be converted. Nobody comes to the table and receives grace. You can't bring an unsaved person in and say, here, have this communion with me and you'll receive salvation. Not at all, but it can point them to their need for salvation. Now, I know that traditionally as a church, we have observed the supper on an off night, like a Tuesday. And the reasoning behind that, at least one of them, is a concern that the table be only for baptized believers. And that impulse to keep the table a distinctly Christian ordinance for only believers is right and good. And we should keep that. But I think one of the unintended consequences is that we have not been able to proclaim the Lord's death to people who need to see it proclaimed. And so in... Ten days on Sunday the 9th, I am praying that we will have unsaved people here with us Sunday night at 6 p.m. Not so they can partake or participate, but so they can watch. So they can look around and see you as you picture the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And through that, they can be drawn and pointed to the salvation that they so desperately need. So the Lord table proclaims the gospel thirdly. The purpose of the Lord's table is to give us fellowship with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Paul is speaking about the Lord's Supper, and he says this to the Corinthians, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Uh, Through participating in the table, believers picture the communion, uh, that Greek word is koinonia, or fellowship, that we have with Christ. God because of Christ's death on the cross. Now this statement about fellowship with Christ through body and blood is in the context of Paul's warning to the Corinthians about eating meat offered to idols. Remember, there were some Corinthians that said, well, I can eat whatever I want to, and so they would go to the the pagan tables of false worship, and they would just eat whatever was put in front of them, and Paul had to remind them, okay, even though an idol doesn't really exist, there's only one God, you you should still be careful about going to demonic places because uh, you are giving kind of an identification that I am okay with this practice. Um, And so he says in the same way that you resist fellowship with devils by rejecting their table, you should embrace fellowship with the Lord by embracing the Lord's table. Verse 20, he says, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. When someone gets baptized, when they uh, partake in that ordinance, we understand, we even say it as we watch them get baptized here in church. We say, this doesn't save anybody. It is an identification. It is a picture that somebody is coming saying, I identify with Christ. And that's what the Lord's Supper does as well. Just as the ordinance of baptism identifies us with Christ initially, the Lord's Supper identifies us with Christ continually. In a sense, when we come and we gather together for communion, we are pledging our allegiance to Christ by coming to his table and fellowshipping with him through communion. But it's not just our relationship with God that is impacted by communion. Fourthly, we see that the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to unite us to other Christians in our local church, to unite us as a body of believers. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17, I'll read it for you. Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now here it is. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. In John 17, 21, Pastor read it a couple weeks ago in our Sunday morning service. Jesus prayed for Christians that we all would be one. And Jesus says, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, I pray that they also may be one in us. 
And through his prayer, Jesus is teaching believers that their relationship with God should affect their relationship with others. If you have a vertical relationship with God, it should work its way out into a horizontal relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. When we are saved, we enter a new family. John 1 says that we become the sons and daughters of God. We are adopted. We are placed into his family, given a place in his inheritance. But it's not just that we gain a father, we gain brothers and sisters as well. And though we may, we may be different in so many ways, language, economic, social status, uh, backgrounds, whatever, we are one in Christ. And the Lord's Supper is an outward representation of that internal unity that we share. John Hammett wrote, as we partake, we ought to literally look around to discern the body of Christ God has providentially placed us in and renew our love for our brothers and sisters and experience fellowship with them. But Paul says the supper doesn't just, it doesn't just picture our unity. He goes a step further in 1 Corinthians 10, and he says that the supper actually brings unity to a church. As they partake of the bread, the same bread, and as they drink of the same cup, they are actually being made one through this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. He says, for we being many are one bread and one body. Why is that? For we are all partakers of one bread. You know, it's been a, a strange four or five months being disconnected. We haven't been able to gather like we wanted to. We haven't been able maybe to have people in our homes or share fellowship with other believers uh, because of health risks or all sorts of things. And if you're feeling disconnected from the body, if you're feeling like you just uh, need fellowship or maybe you've been cut off, can I encourage you? One of the ways that you can be united with your brothers and sisters at Bible Baptist Church is to come and to partake of the Lord's Supper. Maybe you're feeling disconnected connected because you're looking at people and say, well, I'm viewing these particular areas differently. We've got an election coming up. And maybe you're saying, well, I, I think differently about politics than this person. Maybe you're thinking about the pandemic and you're saying, well, I'm viewing this whole mask thing or the coronavirus and this person is uh, really strong on this side. I'm really strong over here. And it feels like there's a wedge between me and another church member. Can I tell you, bridge that gap. Find unity, not in all these outside things, politics, health issues, economics, what you think schools should do. Find unity around the table of the Lord. We all share in salvation. We all share in the blood and the body of Christ. And God gave that to us in order to remind us that the thing that unites us is the salvation that we share. Bobby Jameson again says, Paul roots the church's unity in celebration of the Lord's Supper. There is one body because there is one bread. Paul is saying that the Lord's Supper actually makes many one. The Lord's Supper gathers up the we who are many and makes us into one body. That's why Paul instructed the Corinthians, wait for one another. They were going early. Some were lagging behind, and so they were eating at different times and calling it communion. And five times in chapter 11, he says, when you come together, highlighting the importance of us doing this as a gathered body. The Lord's Supper is not just an individual act between a believer and God. It is something that was meant for the church to observe together. So in 10 days when we gather to take the bread and the cup, we should be aware that God means this to bring us together as one body. You are not just saying, God, I commit myself to you and, identif and I identify with you. You are saying all these people that are around me, I identify with them and I commit myself to them as well because we are members of the same body. Lastly, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is this, to anticipate the second coming of Christ. To anticipate the second coming of Christ. In Matthew 26, 29, on the night when Jesus instituted the ordinance with his disciples, he told them, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Every time we partake in the Lord's Supper, it is like we are having a dress rehearsal for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Our eyes should be drawn forward to the day when we will eat and drink, not just with other believers, but with all believers in the presence of Christ himself. And the one that we are commemorating on earth, we will actually celebrate with 
in heaven. As we break the bread and pour the cup, it is natural for us to look back at the death of the Lord. The symbolism is vivid, and it calls us to ponder the sacrifice Christ has already made, but we should be careful not to neglect the anticipation that the supper brings. Even in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul points the Corinthians back to that night with Jesus in the upper room, he makes sure to remind the believers that as they partake in the supper, they proclaim the Lord's death, until he comes. There's wisdom in coming to the table with reverence and a serious mind, but our confidence that Christ will come again and once again sit around the table with us should give us a sense of joy and hopeful anticipation that what we are doing here on earth is a shadow of what is to come. And one day, the God who saved us through his death on the cross will come and will sit next to us and with us and we will partake again in his very presence in the new heaven. The supper proclaims that the same Lord who died, was raised, and ascended to the Father will return in triumph, blessing, and judgment. And so church, I want to encourage you as we come to the table in 10 days, I want you to be hopeful. I want you to anticipate what is coming. Uh, One of the songs that we sing uh, at church here is, Is He Worthy? And the first verse says, Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. In the same song, we talk about how Christ will come again to dwell with us. And the supper should draw our minds to that and picture this wonderful celebration that we will have when Christ takes us home to be with him. In a few days, we're going to gather together as a church. I hope you can make it. I want to encourage you, even if you haven't been yet, come together with us. Uh, We'll do our best to be socially distanced, although not spiritually distanced. But this is the reason why we're having the Lord's Supper, to remember Christ to proclaim the gospel, to fellowship with Christ, to be united with one another, and to anticipate the coming of Christ. Take some time, read through 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Think through these things in church. It'll be a great time on August 9th as we come and partake in the Lord's Supper. Thanks for being here tonight. We'll see you on Sunday.